friends, one and all, I am Rob, and I'm here today to talk to you about a product that's out and available, and it's relatively new, and you might be asking yourself, is this worth getting? So, we're going to have another episode of Rob Reviews today, and the subject for today is Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, which is, of course, a supplement for 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, a fairly common game these days, lots of people playing it, and with this newest book out, a lot of people are kind of going to wonder, is this worth my money? At $50 a crack, these books aren't cheap, and buying them may be an investment for you. So, today we're going to look at Tasha and figure out if this is a good product that's worth your time and money. So, Tasha's is a continuation of what took place with Xanathar's Guide to Everything. Basically, it's a consolidation piece. It takes a lot of elements from different game books that have been already published, smooshes them together into one consistent guide that has been vetted by Wizards of the Coast as appropriate for standard play. Now, with Sword Co uh, sorry, with uh, Xanathar's Guide to Everything, they took a lot of elements from different books, like they took a lot of the spells from Princes of the Apocalypse. Um, they had a huge number of different paths and oaths and all the other ways of differentiating your classes as they might branch out. And Tasha's does the same thing to a lesser extent. It has a variety of options that makes playing the different classes and uh, choosing ways in uh, how they can be differentiated in new and different ways. This can be exciting for people who have tried a few of the old things and none of them just really seemed to work well. Uh, for instance, the Barbarian gets the Path of the Beast and the Path of Wild Magic. These are interesting. The Path of the Beast it's, it's got some cool powers that don't overlap with the path of the totem. Um, give them some own, something that brings them a little closer to being a druid, honestly. The path of wild magic is different. Not a way I would really have put barbarians, but yeah, that's all right. Um, as far as the bard, the bards have the College of Creation, the College of Eloquence. Uh, the College of Eloquence would be excellent for an NPC mastermind type character with bardic spellcasting abilities. Uh, the creation is neat. Got definitely some neat areas. Uh, the cleric has the order domain, the peace domain, and the twilight domain. Um, all quite interesting. The, the, the peace domain... I always found adventurers to be incompatible with peace and uh, the, the, the whole path of nonviolence as much as possible. Um, doesn't really jibe well with Dungeons and Dragons somewhat violent world, but it's all right It makes some nice healers and everything um, Order is very solid works lockstep with fighting against chaos which adventurers finally frequently find themselves doing and Twilight will be popular The shadow stuff is 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 pretty cool, and it makes kind of a cool stealthy cleric possible uh, the Druids getting the Circle of Spores, it's weird. It's strange, but I mean, if you want something custom-made for your gnomish Druids who, you know, are maybe friends with the uh, Myconids and what have you, uh, it could be an uh, interesting flavor, but I generally see that being as something more popular with NPCs. Um, but, hey, if you like it, more power to you. Uh, the Circle of Wildfire will be a popular one, I think. It's, it's pretty strong. The Circle of Stars has n very neat elements. The idea of you know, not just the natural world around you, but actually looking out into uh, other natures. It's, 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 it struck me as being interesting, and I think overall the balance between them is, is all right. People will eventually pick apart these and saying this is an A-class tier and B-class tier and C-class tier, and I might even do that at some point. But just going over what the different things are could be very useful uh, to somebody looking into this. The fighter gets the Rune Knight and Psy Warrior. Oh yes, Psy becomes much more of a thing. Also what's useful is they give more maneuver options for battle masters. And then they do something really nice. They go back and they group the different abilities together 
to kind of give you ideas for bundles of powers that stack well together with different themes for Battle Masters, which makes the Battle Master a lot more of a guided play and much less of just a shopping a la carte experience, which I know has sometimes left Battle Masters falling on just one or maybe two of their maneuvers all the time and never using some of the other ones. This would kind of guide you towards the ones that generally synergize the best together. Um, it's not a bad treatment. Um, Psy, okay, for those of you who really wish they had Scions or the development that was uh, available in uh, third edition with the expanded Scionic handbook with the different Scion classes and things, this isn't going to be that. They don't make the mistake of tacking on extra rule sets like the Scionic combat rules from first and second edition. <sighs> don't miss those at all. They don't make the mistake of slapping that stuff on in an overlay to try to make this work. They fit it within the framework of 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Your Sionic powers are just a flavor of spell. It's okay by me. It, it maintains balance at the very least. It doesn't go with anything too exotic and allows it to be an easy experience for anybody to pick up. And It's okay, cool, your stuff is just Sionic, that's all. It's not that bad. Um, the Monk. Uh, the Way of Mercy and the Way of the Astral Self. Interesting, certainly. Um, monks have, in my opinion, been all over the spectrum as far as their, their different paths that they can take. You have some that are clearly better at one thing or another. If you're going to be the Way of the Four Elements, for instance, you are basically going to try to be a, a a, a, a bender, a airbender, earthbender, whatever, from Avatar. It's kind of worked into that, although you can differentiate between different ones. Um, it's it's all right. It's interesting. Um, the way of the, the fist, the fighting types, obviously for those who really love the combat and being able to just ruin people with, with hand-to-hand in limited, ex you know, as strikers more so than a tank. Um, they're, they're pretty good for that. Um, and you're going to get uh, the Way of Mercy. Interesting elements. Again, what I said about pacifism doesn't work that well. The Way of Mercy doesn't make you a pacifist in this case. It just means that you have uh, some, some ways of healing other people and a different outlook on the adventuring life, which might fit different groups better. Again, remember, this is a kinder, gentler Wizards of the Coast, so they're going to want to put in some elements that let people play not as the stereotypical, you know, D&D &D adventuring party, kill all orcs, etc., etc., but there's a lot of things that are even cooked into Tasha where it's like, you know what, it's okay to play in a different style. You don't need to take our rules and our default world and play exactly like that. You can do things the way you want. And some of these paths dovetail into that philosophy a little bit more. Uh, the Paladin gets the Oath of Glory. That's interesting. That's actually from... Uh, Actually, one thing I should should bring up real quick. Yeah, I, I better do this. Uh, this book takes heavy elements out of Mythic Odyssey of Theros, Sword Coast Adventures Guide, and Eberron. The biggest thing they take from Eberron, they, they, they bring in the Artificer class, so you don't need to have Eberron to play an Artificer. The, there's different elements from all of these different books. There's also stuff from the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, which I'm not all that interested about. That's the last book I really care to get because I'm not a, not a huge, raving World of Magic magic fan. Um, but if you have these books, to a lesser extent, this book is going to be somewhat devalued because you already have access to the information. If you really love the Oath of Glory, it's in Theros. If you love the Artificer, it's in Eberron. Um, and a lot of these spells come are neat and cool, but they reference spells from Xanathar's just as much. So, just warning you right off the bat, there is a bunch of overlap in here, as intended. And I'll tell you why that's not necessarily a bad thing. Just give me a sec. Okay, so um, the Oath of Glory is kind of cool. The Oath of the Watchers, kind of cool. Nice flavor to them. Um, 
The Oath of Glory could really lend itself to people who like playing those kind of jerk paladins who only care about how awesome they are. Um, that's not necessarily a red flag, it's just a different avenue of play, but... Uh, the Ranger gives you the Fey Wanderer and the Swarm Keeper. The coolest thing is that they give you different options for the Beast Companions. I like that aspect. It actually makes those companions more useful in the later game. Um, I have, however, seen play of a person who's using a beast master well with their with their abilities, constantly aiding themselves with their companion and stuff. And I really never bought into beast masters being the absolute most feeble, but this helps quite a bit. <clears throat> quite a bit. Uh, the Rogue has the Phantom and the Soul Knife. Again, the Soul Knife, you're going into Psy Powers. Um, I always thought the Psy bla so Soul Blade, Psy Blade, whatever, was a kind of a cool ability. And, uh, you know, Rogues rarely lack in flavor. You generally have an idea when you when you are playing a Rogue of, of what you're getting into. Um, having different paths, though, makes it so that your Rogues are a little less samey, and that's not a bad thing. The Phantom, of course, is a person who, even though all all the rogues have the potential to be really good at stealth, the Phantom just ratches that up so you can get in and out of places without much chance of being seen at all, whereas most rogues just give you a pretty good chance at stealth. Uh, the Warlock. Okay, the Warlock gets a lot of love. Um, they get more invocation options, which, that's a pretty big toolbox already. Uh, they get a few new class features, which is cool. They also get uh, access to a couple more patrons. The Fathomless, which are your de Lords of the Deep uh, from the Elemental Chaos. And I'm thinking Ol' Hydra, the Elemental Princess of Water, might be a really good patron for this. No, it's kind of weird that they didn't also have just the general Elemental Lords Imix, for instance, would certainly be somebody who would be interested in very destructive warlocks. The Elemental Prince of Fire. Um, Yancy Bin, the Elemental Prince of Air, certainly is intelligent enough to realize that having warlocks court him for power could be very useful in causing even more destruction. Ogremach is a little on the dull side of the El Elemental Prince of Earth, but could probably do just fine um, for people who just, you know, really endurant and stuff. But by and large, um, you know, it, it, it makes it, it makes sense. And genies are often seen, the genie princes are often powerful enough that you could think they might be able to have uh, warlocks, and they'd certainly have a different spin on the whole part of being a warlock, having these super powerful, capricious, magical creatures as your patron. Um, I find it to be interesting. Plus, you know, if there's a, an Ifrit Pasha who has warlocks, they could be every bit as destructive and pyromaniac as you might want and have a master who's not necessarily purely based on evil and taking souls and things, which is one of the things I find hard to buy in a warlock, is that they got to do all this under backdoor dealing for bad things to, to happen because their master tells them to. It, that, and again, your mileage may vary, but honestly... I always find it hard to believe a party would willingly travel with a fiendish pack warlock who isn't constantly fighting against their oppressor, against the, the person who's giving them the power but demanding horrible things in exchange. And if your patron isn't demanding things if you're a warlock as a DM, maybe you should think about that because just seems hand in glove, quite honestly, being able to manipulate your warlock. It's like, oh, you have all this power. You can blast things. I give you all these different, but I want something out of you first. It's not just about when you die, you get your soul, which certainly happens too. And then as wizards, they take blade singing out of Sword Coast Adventures, um, which I know some people, you know, like. I really was turned off of Blade Singers as a concept back when they were a part of the uh, kits from Second Edition D and D. They were just ridiculous. Um, that was from the, I believe, the Elves, the Complete Guide to the Elves. Um, just overly powered. Well, maybe it was from Wizard, the, the Complete Guide to Wizards. But anyhow, um, hated them then. Um, I've kind of warmed up to them. They are a burst character class. 
um, where they can do amazing things for a very limited amount of time, their ability to glide through combats and things. So they're okay. Uh, anything that has wizards move up into close combat, have, have fun with that. You probably deserve everything you're going to get. And then the Order of Scribes, interesting, certainly. Uh, but as far as, you know, scribes go thematically, um, uh, most wizards are beneath, or find scribe work beneath them. In this case, they kind of give it an interesting twist in that a, a reason for this almost, I don't know, monastic isn't quite the, the right word, but, a, but an order that just dotes upon the, the paths of knowledge and has all of these different abilities that they can unlock with the written word um, is not bad. Not bad. Again, I think those would be great NPC uh, characters to, to take into account. So there's a lot of things. There's also some new feats, which is cool. Those are, again, cobbled together from the various guides. And... Uh, you know, that gives you a nice flavor for everything that you've already got in the player's handbook. So adding this means you don't have to get those books to access those different paths that are unlocked. Now, the Artificer class itself is something that they, they lavished a bit of attention on because they ripped it right out of Eberron. Now, if you don't like Eberron as a world, it's a super high-tech, high-magic tech world. Um, that's fine. Keith Baker's baby is... Uh, good for some people. Maybe some people don't like that in their fantasy. It is a well-realized world that's quite deep, good, rich lore. It's very solid, I find. But for me, I love pulling things out of it. I love the idea of the Warforged as a player character race. Absolutely. I'm fine with it. Um, dragon marks and the dragon houses and all that, I'm fine with. The Artificer class is something that I Happy is now in Dungeons and Dragons. To be fair, Pathfinder had it first as a, you know, deity 3.5 something. And I've only recently gotten really into Pathfinder, and I find that um, it's fine. The, the way that they look at it in this game makes it a balanced class with the others. It's a spellcasting class. But instead of spells as in magic, you make magic, as in make magic, using your tools to, to quickly build things. It is mad science, is what it really is. The problem with that, and I have three major problems with it. Number one, it assumes that you only do the same thing again and again and again, which is kind of contrary to mad science. Um, but you learn how to create these effects by tinkering and, and, and jerry-rigging uh, to make devices that create your effects. Which is fine, I guess that's how you have to do it for 5th for edition. It doesn't feel like mad science, it feels like you're spell casting, but you carry extra junk around with you. Um, the, the overall class, though, is, is for the most part fine. You can wear some armor and you're fairly tough. It, it really comes off a lot like clerics, I find. Um, but... Off of that, uh, the paths that they can take are interesting. Alchemists, well, they can quickly make potions and, and, and other uh, avenues for their, their magics, and, and they're fine. I really, though, if you know me, I really fundamentally believe that alchemy could be its own class. An alchemist could be a standalone class, not just an expansion of the artificer. But... If I had my way, I'd blow up the entire Artificer class and break it down into several different avenues, which they do a fairly good job of. Uh, they have the Artillerist, somebody who creates basically magical guns. To, and uh, some of those can be independent of the caster. So like you can build a personal cannon and have it follow you and shoot what you want it to. They have a, a really nice little uh, image of a gnome uh, Artificer with a basically an eldritch cannon that's shaped like a cockatrice and shows it blasting his enemies. It's really nice. Um, then there's the battlesmith. Somebody who looks like they work on making their own suit of power armor, effectively, and are very good with, with, with the forging of items and, and, and goods. Uh, which is pretty cool. And then they talk about all these different infusions that they have. Now, a lot of their stuff 
for the Artificer. And I'm going to cover this in far more detail in my review of the Eberron book when I get to that point. But a lot of the infusions kind of work like a cross between uh, Warlock's uh, uh, basically their uh, special powers, their Eldritch invocations, in that it's a different aspect of what they can do, what they can make. And instead of having a power that they can rely upon, they have something along with them that they can rely upon, which can go anywhere from uh, creating a homunculus servant to follow them around and do minor chores for them, uh, enhancing a weapon, which can, can get better and better, and, you know, all these different things that they can get. And that is basically the way that you tailor the thrust of how your artificer makes uh, the things around them better. They tinker, they improve. Much like Iron Man putting everything into making suits of, of armor with blasting and flight and stuff like that, um, the artificer finds their own way to hack the world by making their own things better as a hallmark of their trade. It's kind of cool. Uh, as far as balance goes, I'm sure they've worked on it quite a bit. Uh, so I'm really not too worried. Everything that I saw looked like it was pretty well balanced for, you know, consideration for the person in a, in a group of adventurers. The Artificer is not a full spellcasting class. They only go up to fifth level. And their spell lists are, you know, pretty solid. Uh, their cantrips are cool. Many of the attack cantrips, which could be described as them making a ray, a ray gun or a chemical sprayer or something. At their top level, they get fun things like Big B's hand. Can you imagine this giant clockwork hand that they send out? Possible. Um, but if you're looking for these characters to become huge blasting types, um, not so much. They, they do they do have a few you know decent attacking spells but for the most part most of their stuff is their utility magics which is fine I suppose especially if you you know couple that with the gear that you're going to find getting things that actually work well for your character and balancing out the style of play that you want uh, they could be quite quite satisfying to play I suspect again I haven't play tested any of this so this is just me looking and, you know, you know, in my mind, you know, breaking down things and tendencies and, and, and uh, so. Then there's the magic section. Now, first of all, they take a lot of spells from the different books, which is important. But it's not, as, not nearly as many as they had for Xanathar's Guide. Um, and several of them are going to be Tasha's themed spells, because, well, Tasha left her imprint on magic. For those of you who might be somewhat familiar with the, the uh, histories of Greyhawk, uh, Tasha was the daughter of Baba Yaga, the queen of hags, and she eventually became the lover of Grast, the demon prince of lust, and her, she changed her name to Igwilv. She turned out to be quite a nasty character in the end. In this, this has her in her aspect of super powerful and yet definitely evil. Sardonic is probably the, the word I would, I would prefer to use because she's not malevolent, but she clearly has a bent sense of morality in that she finds amusement in good, but is not does, is unflinchingly uh, you know, her own person and much like... Maleficent from, from the Disney uh, movies. Um, perfectly capable of leveling those who have wronged her, but generally just reveling in being herself. And, uh, you know, in a way, kind of sympathetic as you go through that. The biggest advantage that this one has, though, is the collection of magical items that it gives. Quite, quite, quite frankly, they, they go from my, relatively minor magical items to really powerful ones and some very cool flavors. With Baba Yaga's mortar and pestle for getting around is, is just crazy. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to break down every single one of them, but it, they generally tend toward a little bit of the darker side. 
and uh, they have a good blend of magics to kind of filter in to your already, by this time, probably burgeoning selection of magical items uh, so that you have something different to throw at players from time to time. The advantages of this book do tend to fade away the more you use it in that you know it offers up surprises and things for the players that player characters that they might not have expected might not have seen over time they might come across some of these and then some of the a little bit of the thrill is gone when you've seen an item once or twice already but still having more magical items generally trumps not so uh, those are nice especially though since again several of these are from those other books you might already have access to access to some, so um, this is kind of more of a consolidation. And then finally, we go to Dungeon Master's Tools. Now, I am a firm believer in setting up the next generation of gamers. I, I love going out and proselytizing how good of a hobby role-playing games are, and I love seeing people take their first step into DMing. It's not instinctive, however. I understand that there's a learning curve. I understand the value of having a sympathetic group around you who can, who will be okay if you screw up now and again and sometimes have to you know, maybe reset things or roll with different crazy ideas that you might have. I'm fine with that, but having things that guide people along those first steps is really useful. This book has a few things that really should be, almost should have been in the, the Dungeon Master's Guide anyhow. Um, I probably would have been okay with about half of the magical items that were in the Dungeon Master's Guide and this stuff having been in there. But of course, some of it, you know, they only wrote later on after the Dungeon Master's Guide came out, and I can appreciate that. Things like talking about the Session Zero, what a useful tool that is for setting up a campaign, especially if you're doing it in a world and your players aren't intimately familiar with that world. If you've run something in the Forgotten Realms, imagine somebody coming into it and knowing nothing about the Forgotten Realms. Think about what that's like. You can try to tell them as much as you want, but if you don't have a Session Zero to kind of put people on the right path, they're going to be like, who's this Elminster guy? Or, what's what, the, the Council of Lords? What, what? Okay, they're a bunch of nobles. What do they matter? Who's this Drist fellow? I don't know, that's probably penetrated enough into pop culture and everything. But... Having a Session Zero is incredibly useful for bringing people up to speed on your world and how they can interact in your world, what they can expect, and so that they can actually role play unflinchingly into the world, which is nice. Um, this actually goes, hey, this is, this is how you set it up. This is what you do when you do a Session Zero, which is cool. They have a section on sidekicks. I have had somebody you know, in front of me going, well, this allows you to play solo play. You can have your character and they can have sidekicks. Now, sidekicks are a little bit like player characters, except, uh, number one, they are a bag of abilities and they aren't as cool as you are. They never will be as cool as you are. Their ability, they get some abilities similar to player character abilities, but they come slower than the characters get. And they're just kind of a handy thing to have around to supplement your player characters. So, for instance, if you are understaffed and you want somebody to be able to have a sidekick of a spellcaster, for instance, your, your spell light, uh, they have uh, stats in here so that you can set up a spellcaster who is basically like a wizard of some sort, but with a much lighter touch. So they're not going to overshadow the player characters. Um, they only get up to 5th level of magics, for instance, no matter what their, their class is. And they know, uh, you know, a couple of cantrips, for the most part, their list looks, you know, fairly reasonable, like a backup caster would be, something like the Artificer. But that is their, their thrust. The Warrior has some abilities similar to a Fighter, but at the same time, it is quite clear that uh, the fighter gets more and stronger abilities as they go. Uh, the warrior is just there as a stopgap stop to keep bad things away from you so that you can uh, try to do your thing and have your, uh, your sidekick kind of take care of the things that aren't in your specialty. 
uh, the expert, if you want somebody who's just a lock picker, for instance, or someone who's just a historian, saddle your group with an expert sidekick, and they can handle all that thinky stuff, so your player characters don't, and they can focus on combat or, or whatever makes them run. It's basically for patching a hole in your group, which is cool. Uh, there's a section on parlaying with monsters, for instance. It's like, hey, let's teach your players that they don't just have to kill everything or run from everything. There's a middle ground. Even beasts can be negotiated with, often easier than creatures with more complex motivations. Just give them some food. Give them an option to combat, and most of them will take it if it's satisfying to them. Give an owlbear enough meat, and even though it's kind of a nasty creature, it's not going to come after you. If it's got enough meat to fill it, why would it exert the extra effort and risk getting injured if those uh, humans, dwarves, elves, halflings, tieflings, uh, tabaxi, whatever, in their armor with their sharp swords give you a really good reason not to, and they have food in front of you? Take the food and go. Makes sense. Um, also talking about, you know, dealing with other creatures from position of strength. Ideas for game masters who don't have much else going on. And this is the foundations that you can build experience onto. So I, that, it's fine. The section on supernatural regions is really kind of cool, in my mind. Uh, the idea that different areas can be so infused that it kind of changes some of your expectations in the reality. Uh, and there are several different suggestions which are really actually quite good at flavoring how you can... Uh, change different areas and, and make them more challenging or scarier or, or something. Um, a lot of them are similar to like layer effects. Like if you're going into a dragon's lair, you expect that the dragon has tailored it to suit their defense, but also a part of their their personal presence kind of echoes in and allows them to create magical effects and things. This is similar to that. It's talking about taking an area and completely channeling some aspect of the supernatural into it so that your basic expectations of up is down, up is up and down is down, and may be challenged. And the selection that they give, as well as their you know, different phenomenon too, which is excellent, um, uh, you've got blessed radiance, you've got far realm incursions, you've got places that are haunted or infested with creatures. Um, a mirror zone is fabulous just absolutely hilarious psychic resonance again we've got more psi abilities in here and uh then on uh, magical phenomenon different things that can also provide challenges like magical storms or uh primal the uh, primal or there's an emanations coming through magic mushrooms who doesn't love magic mushrooms in their games so, some just neat ideas for how you can further make your world magical and different and unique, and so that every encounter isn't just, we fight the goblins. How much more scary is it fighting goblins and cramped goblin tunnels that are haunted? Could be very interesting. Um, and then there are natural hazards, too, like how to handle avalanches, or uh, falling onto a creature. Sure. The last section of the game is based on puddles, puzzles and riddles. And I'll tell you this, your mileage may vary on this. Some people hate puzzles. Some people can't stand riddles. They do represent something of a breaking of immersion. Why? Because they generally rely on the players, not the characters, to come up with solutions to the puzzles or riddles. And for some things, puzzles and riddles are relatively easy. For instance, if you're LARPing and you have a puzzle or a riddle, well, you're you, and it's very on hand, and that's one thing. Doing it when you're a genius of a character with a 22 intelligence comes across a, a, a riddle, and you as a player are kind of like, I'm not thinking tonight real well, um, I'm not getting it. But my character probably would. Version breaks a little bit because you're being called on to do something. And back in the day, that wasn't really so much of a problem, because your characters were really just avatars of you. You're still driving them and providing the common sense that they needed to survive. So riddles really weren't going to break that any further. But now, with everything being about the role play, some people just really hate them. Now, these riddles are well thought out. They're fine. 
Here's the problem. Now they're mass published. Anybody who has access to this book can read through the riddles at the back of the book. So these are good for examples of how to set up puzzles and things that you can do to set up a riddle. But I would really hesitate about putting them in your game unless you're absolutely certain that your players are not going to have access to Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. You might be further off going and off and finding a different book of riddles if you're going to, you know, seriously be doing things like that. And goodness knows, there are plenty of resources out there for people who love thinking traps and riddles and puzzles and things like that. So, and that is Tasha's Guide to Everything. Now, I said I was going to cover a few things, and I'm going to. First of all, why would I get this if I already have all the other books? If I have the Guildmaster's Guide to Ravnica, if I have Sword Coast Adventures Guide, if I have the Mythic Odyssey of Theros, or if I have um, the other one, the Eberron book. Why would I get this if I have all that? Two things. Number one, if you're making a character, you don't want to have five books out in front of you flipping through them. It's a pain. If you're making a monk, for instance, I want at most three books in front of me, and several of them are going to get closed pretty quickly. I'll have the player's handbook out, of course, and I'll look through the core classes, because those are the ones that had the most work and care at, at, at leveling and balancing. I'll have Xanathar's Guide to Everything out, because they have more paths, more options, and something might tickle my fancy for the character that I'm envisioning that I want to make. And I'll have Tasha's out for exactly the same reason more ideas, more possibilities, something that might fit in better. Now, I firmly believe that a flexible GM can allow the players to come in with a preconceived notion and somehow figure out a way in the session zero to make it work. Some people just have that character they want to play, irregardless of what world they're in or any kind of special rules or restrictions that the game master has. Um, so, for instance, if you want to have a character where everybody's good, there's no edginess, and so the uh, the the or, uh, domain of twilight is closed to clerics, for instance, setting that up in session zero is essential. Because if somebody comes in, they're like, oh, I want to play the one of these new twilight clerics. Be like, eh, no, no, not allowed. Um, the session zero is useful. But I I can get just about everything from all those other books just by looking through these three. And if I want anything on Artificer, I only need one book, because that's right there in Tasha's now. So that is my player's handbook for Artificers. Yes, I could go to Ebron's book, and I can look through that too, but eh, it's okay. Um, I'm kind of sad that Tasha's didn't have more on the different races that have come out, um, you know, like the Warforged and stuff like that. But, you know, there's, there's only so much there that you really need to do. Uh, as far as the extra magical items, I already said, you know, they may be in other books, but honestly, if I'm a dungeon master, I want to f pepper and salt through a few special and unique items. If I look through that, I can do that without having to go and backtrack through the sources. So that could be really pretty darn useful. Um, I'll give you that a good chunk of the value of this is in having access to the Artificer class. If you have Eberron, that does take away some of the value because obviously you have a book that gives you as much about the Artificer, and, and it works just fine. Um, if you're a brand new DM, you're going to get some decent value out of the Dungeon Master's tips. Um, although, goodness knows, I have been espousing things like the Session Zero for quite some time. Uh, some of the different elements, though, are useful to read through and uh, absorb into your play style. Uh, so as far as a teaching guide, there's a little bit in there that's useful. $50 useful? No. But definitely some things that might help structure the way that you run a game better uh, so that you know it's smoother, your players have a little bit better time. You have to work a bit less by building up those structures in advance. As far as uh, the riddles and puzzles, they're nice. Certainly, if you can keep them, uh, keep this book out of your players' hands, they have some whole handouts that you can just reproduce and hand out to your players and let them puzzle through it, which is fine. If you, if you have players who aren't trustworthy, they'll quickly go to the back and they'll memorize everything. If you are yourself an untrustworthy player, you will do this uh, simply so that 
You know, if you come up to a DM who wants to throw this riddle at you, you'll know it. But that's, you know, a, a good, for instance, a good movie is only as good until you know the twist. And then after that is forever, something is ruined for it. It might still be a great movie, but without that twist, you know, you probably remember the first time you heard, Luke, I am your father. No, no, I am your father. Um, plot twist, oh my gosh, the world has changed. Darth Vader is actually Anakin Skywalker. Um, since then, it's trite. And if that's a spoiler for you, I, I can't help you. I can't. But the different things that are in this are nice, but not essential if you are not afraid of going through your other books to get this information. The fact they're all bundled together in, a, in an attractive package is wonderful for those of us who really like the convenience. Now, this does not obviate the need for these other books too. For instance, the Sword Coast Guide is obviously targeted more for the Sword Coast. So if you're gonna be doing your adventures in the Sword Coast, this is still very, very useful. The elements that they talk about in here, for example, on patronage comes out of this. And having people that are around you who uh, sponsor you, they help you get the things that you need and push you out after the tasks that they find are important. Uh, a very nice part in this book, uh, in, in Tasha's, uh, comes out of this. And this one has the patrons that are in the Sword Coast. So it's going to talk about the Council of Lords. It's going to talk about the Emerald Enclave. It's going to talk about the Zentarum. So it does not obviate the need for these other books, but it might lessen the, the feeling that you might have of wanting to get those, especially from this point on. Now, if you're like me and they come up with a new book and you're like, God, I really want it. You know, I, I just I really want that. Um, like uh, when the mythical, uh, the mythical Odyssey of Theros came out, I'm like, I don't want to buy that all that much you know the idea of greek legends and stuff i i'm cool with but i don't oh my god it came with a free map if i get it yes i did that but it turns out the book is really good anyhow so i'm not really uh regretting that decision and there's so much extra stuff in there that What's in Tasha's Guide to Everything is a slice. It's a very narrow slice. This will help you make your characters quicker, broader selection. Yes. This will give you a few extra spells so that when you're looking for new spells, you can look through that. And if your Game Master allows it, because everything in this book is optional, Game Master doesn't have to say it's okay. Doesn't can say any of this is, is not okay. Although, from what I've seen, it's pretty well balanced and, and well considered. Um, it's fine. Honestly, the stuff under the engine for the Game Master, I think, is the most useful stuff and does help to recoup that cost back. I'd say it just scrapes the value barrel at being worth about $50 to, to most people, and if you can get it for less, of course, go for it. Um, the art is fantastic, as Dungeons & Dragons has really had great art through 5th edition, with the exception of Halflings. There's another Halfling in there with a bloated Mardi Gras head. I can't stand that look. They, their bodies couldn't hold those massive heads up. It's the same artistic decision they went with for some of the characters in the, the player's handbook, and I can't stand the way they make halflings look now with their tiny little feet, their tiny little arms, their massive heads. There's still one of those in here. But on the other hand, there's a goblin in a lovely pink dress with a wand, and it's awesome. So there's some very nice art in here. It's a, it's a pleasure to look through. Of course, make sure that when you get the book, you open it up, and inside you look at the disclaimer, because every one of the 5th the edition books has a wonderful, cute little disclaimer, which is great. Um, and, and, and like I said, the art is excellent. And if you get the, the, the basic uh, book art, or if you get the alternate art, um, I, get, I always get the basic art because I like the consistency of theme, and I, I, these are beautiful pictures, beautiful images. Um, Tasha's is a welcome uh, addition to my collection because this helps me. It helps me to create characters, it helps me keep a lot of ideas in one cool place that I can draw from, and I still have access to those other things if I want to delve deeper into, say, the world of Theros, or if I want to really consider uh, the role of gods in, a, in an adventure, I have that. But for lesser things, I've got a collection of all of these different ideas that also work quite well. And, uh... 
I, they've given me some different ideas, certainly, because I haven't read through everything in Sword Coast Adventures Guide. I've skimmed through and I've, I've nibbled little bits out. And someday I will do a review similar to this. But this one is timely because Tasha's just came out and I think people want to know, how is it? Well, the book is okay. It's pretty. It's useful for taking a lot of other ideas. And if you don't have those other books, here's your chance to sip through some of those and get some useful ideas for character creation, for an, al an alternate class, for uh, different DMing tricks and tips and magical items and some spells. But is it worth $50 if you have all those other books? If you, if you don't like the work and you like a consolidation uh, single book, yeah, it's worth it. If you aren't afraid of doing all the extra leg work and you don't find that the extra stuff in here is that compelling, it can be a pass. That's perfectly fine. Um, this is actually also a kind of a useful shortcut for those of you who use D&D Beyond because you can get a lot of the, the hard mechanics for three, three and a half books uh, can be in your game. I'd say only half of Eberron, because Eberron has races and things that are still useful outside of that. But you can get a lot of things plucked out of those that are really useful for running a game uh, if you just pick up the Tasha's Cauldron of Everything rules to be put into your world. So that's my take on Tasha's. Again, decent value. Not awesome. Decent. Um, not subpar. Still pretty good. But, uh, you know, now you know. And uh, knowing is half the battle. I am Rob. Thank you for joining me. This has been another Rob Reviews. Until next time, I will see you here in the lair. If you enjoyed this, if you find this to be useful and you like similar content, please feel free to like and subscribe. Uh, can always use more people in the Omnisci community to, uh, to help grow it out, especially if you have things that you'd like to see. I will make that happen somehow. So barring a certain amount of indecency. Um, but uh, I am uh, always happy to uh, entertain whatever you're interested in, so if you like this and you want to see more of this, let me know. So until next time, though, stay safe, stay sane, play games, have fun, and farewell. <laughs>